situations or scenarios, causing pain is actually of benefit. For example, yeah, I'm, even though you probably can't tell, I have attempted to go to the gym and I've been told, even though I don't have much experience in this, that when, when you do start lifting initially, um, your muscles do start tearing. And, but, but again, it's no pain, no gain. So that pain is actually good because that will, what will result from that is, well, hopefully gains and hopefully, you know, um, better health, more strength, uh, more agility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So how do you kind of reconcile the two? obvious that pain has a utility and that's why I mean we're evolved to have pain to avoid certain things um, and I mean pain has a has a reason um, but that doesn't mean that I mean that's not the real the kind of suffering that I'm talking about um, so so just before you jump into that kind of yeah. suffering so so you you're open to the fact that certain degrees of harm and certain pains can be good for you as well good I say that they have their utility in creating a better life for you but that doesn't mean that um, you know the, the gains that what you gain from that experience I don't think makes life justifiable so let's um, let's st stick with the the bodybuilding example so you'd say it has utility but that wouldn't necessarily improve your life it's not that it wouldn't improve your life it's that it's whether or not that life is it's worth creating in the first place just to sort of have those those gains. Okay, and so gains from whatever small small pleasures that you kind of get. From them. Okay, you're talking about the beginning, right at the beginning when you when you're born. I'm saying that if we take the principle of of pain and harm, and an example of that is is going to the gym. Uh, you, c can you see that there is, you described it as utility, I would actually describe it as, you know, um, I would, I'd describe it as something positive, effective, good, because of, um, and I'll, for, for example, if you're stronger, it gives you more of a presence, you're able to defend your family, you're able to, say, pick up the shopping, um, you're able to play with your child, um, you're able to kind of, it, it helps with the, with the experience of life. So how, how, I'm just struggling to understand how that can be deemed to be that experience in itself, not in the totality of things. How would you deem that to be something of um, negative, uh, negativity? Well, I mean, the pain, I think it's, the pain that you experience doing that is negative, no matter what. It has a utility, but it's still pain. Mm. Um, and I think, I mean, it, I don't think that we'd be arguing in good faith to say that, you know, suffering is a positive thing. Um, it can lead to some better things in your life. That's for the person who's already experiencing those things, if that makes sense. Uh, when, when you look at suffering, would you, would you concede that we are viewing suffering using our our small lens, our understanding of life and of experience. Uh, often when we see pain and suffering, uh, but when we ask the other person, they may not necessarily see pain and suffering like we're seeing it. For example, again coming back to the gym example, somebody would say, you know what, I went there, I, I suffered and I struggled, I didn't like it. Yeah, therefore I came home and I'm not going to go there again. However, if he goes to another person who loves going to the gym, because again, the more you kind of discuss and you unpack this, you realize that just going to the gym, for, for many people, it becomes like once you get past a certain stage, you, you get a, like a release of endorphins, you get confidence. I would argue that the, the positives significantly outweigh the, um, the, the minute nature of the harm or the negative that you get from there. our experiences as different. We all see like different levels of suffering. Uh, some see them as positive, some see them as negative, and we all have different values to our life. Some people really value being strong, going to the gym, pushing through that pain in order to um, have a more positive experience. Um, but that doesn't overall say that, well, because this person views pain as, as a positive thing and in these certain aspects of their life, that doesn't mean that suffering in itself is a positive. Um, so, I guess what, I say, what I'm trying to say is that um, suffering has a utility and, and it needs to. You know, we, we have to say, you know, we feel fire, fire's hot, take your hand away from it. Um, suffering is a part of our 
genetic coding that is programmed in us to make us live. And I guess that's what I'm trying to say is that suffering, suffering is necessary to make us live, but suffering isn't a positive. Um, suffering is created by life. It is an inherent part of life for those who are, are sentient. Um, but then here's here's where we kind of take divergent paths. Uh, sorry to cut you. It's it's that on the on the one hand we're saying well, we both agree that suffering is a bad thing, of course by its nature. But it has on the utility, but it's generally a negative. Experience. Of course, of course. Yeah. So on the one hand, you're saying that hence, as a result, we need to stop procreating, <coughs> whilst we're saying that uh, because nature is inherent, you need to learn to manage it and to control it, and there are ways to have a positive life experience net value that there is it is possible to have a net value positive experience than say a negative experience go ahead i mean that's definitely where we suffer um yeah. definitely where we differ because mm. i don't believe that there can ever be a positive um, net value to life um, and again that comes back to what we had discussed before about whether or not um, we assign uh, moral weight to um, to creating joy um, I mean, I think another way to think of it is, is let's look at sort of the, the best possible experience we could ever have and the worst possible experience. And both happen, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, people experience extreme amounts of pain and extreme amounts of joy. Um, just because they... You know, I, I don't see... If you could either choose between having both that extreme amount of joy and that extreme pain, or having neither, I don't see anyone in good faith actually saying, yeah, I'll choose, you know, being skinned alive so that I can, you know, be in love. Um, I'm just going to cover something that I really should have covered at the beginning, okay. <laughs> um, which is uh, the, what that kind of leads to, which is, are you calling then for the end of civilization as we know it? Um, in so many words. I mean, antinatalism is about um, sort of prescribing the problem, um, which is that birth and basically the DNA molecule... Um, I'm just going to move this hair in the middle if that's okay, yeah, because it's, I think it's catching too much um, antinatalism of Antinatalism prescribes the problem, and then how we then get to solve it is, in an ethical way, is... Um, so end, and, and, end of and humanity? A, Yes, so, so humans would, if we stopped procreating, of course, humans would become like a snake. Um, and, I mean, I don't see what, of course, there would be, you know, things that would be lost, but I don't see that being a net thing. So when, when you've got, like, um, approximately 8 billion people on the planet, uh, and they are going to obviously die because no one's procreating, isn't that causing suffering and well that they're going to die anyway and that's part of the that's part of the um an important part of the whole equation is everyone is going to die um not only that but we are heading you know with the way that we're treating the planet we are heading into um a really really horrible death for ourselves and for the entire planet but ma many many things have happened before um there have been mankind has gone through peaks and troughs there's been positives there's been negatives but if, I mean, this is a very, um, it's a very pessimistic kind of view to say that because suffering's happening, therefore the solution of that is to just stop everything and just to allow uh, us to kind of I mean, wipe think, each other out. I think uh, suffering is also a very minimalistic way to kind of look at it. I think that um, we're all in a very privileged position to sort of say that, um, that suffering, you know, there's suffering, there's joy. I think that, um, there are people out there who are suffering in, in really, really immense ways. Um, but the, well, what about the people that aren't suffering in immense ways? The people well, that we all suffer. And, I, and again, I think this also comes down to the difference that we have in the fact that um, you believe that there can be a net positive, and I don't. Um, and again, that's that's weighing all the the positives of you know the positive things that can happen in life. All so, the Sarah, the, the, and, and whether or not that risk is worth taking. So, Sarah, what you're doing is you're you're basing it upon your kind of subjective experience, your limited understanding, 
or do you accept that you've come to this conclusion based upon your limited observations? You you haven't observed everyone's life. You no, haven't, of course yeah. not. I mean, that's, that would be absurd to say of that course. I've observed everyone's life and I've experienced everything. Precisely. But, um, you know, there are certain things that... That's the only way that we can interpret the world. I mean, so the, so the way we interpret the world that, that you've suggested is induction, which is a process used by science as well, which is you take your limited observations, and when you see there's consistency in there, you come up with a hypothesis. And that hypothesis is open to um, being refuted. It's open to being challenged. Would you, would you say this is a hypothesis, or would you say that this is an end, uh, an, an, an end kind of... Are you treating this like a fact or like a working hypothesis, I guess is what I mean, I'm trying to ask. So it's, um, it's a way of viewing the world, which I can't convince her. I mean, everyone's going to believe that their, their hypothesis is right, no matter right, what. Right. And all I can do is um, convince you. I don't think it goes against anyone's values, honestly. I think that it's, if you believe that suffering is wrong um, and that, you know, birth creates suffering, we're kind of halfway there. Um, it's whether or not you think that... Um, you know, something positive, more positive can be gained through life than not. Um, I don't see that being an equation that we should impose on others, you know. We can decide that for ourselves, and if we could, okay, you can decide for yourself whether or not you want to live, but you can't, we shouldn't impose that on somebody else. Um, taking into account the suffering that they're going to cause others as well. Where, where do you believe all of this started and how, how do you believe everything started as you observe and as you understand? Just everything altogether? Yeah, I mean just the universe, earth, water, trees, yeah. how, I mean, yeah. I mean I'm an atheist if that's what you're going for, um, believe in the Big Bang, um, just a cosmic soup that created us, it was nothing, nothing intelligent, um, we uh, came to be through just fruit forces sort of mashing into each other. So, um, so out of the, the options, do you believe it came from nothing? It created itself. I mean, you've said you don't believe that there's an agency. So I'm assuming there there are two options. If there are more than these two options, feel free to let me know. One is that it created itself, the universe, uh, or the other one, it cre it was created from nothing. I mean, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I can tell no, you. No, no. This is not. Uh, this is again just like yeah. this is a hypothesis of yours, a philosophy of yours. I'm merely just trying to understand the, understand the mind of Sarah. I'm not going to pin you down and say, "Haha, I've got you." Yeah. I'm not here to. I'm not here to do that. We're just here to have a, a conversation and just share and exchange ideas. So I'm just trying to understand your worldview, because to, to understand where things are going, it's very important to understand somewhat the beginning as well. So would you say that, from your understanding, from your atheistic understanding, it came from nothing, or it created itself? Or do you think there's something else that possibly I haven't mentioned that you believe in? I mean, I suppose it came from nothing. Nothing could exist before. So when, when we look at nothing, nothing by definition means the absence of something, isn't it? No thing means the absence of something, isn't it? So from nothing, something emerges. It's a contradiction, isn't it? Sort of, in a lot of ways, yeah. I mean, we can't really know for sure. Um, we can only and that's fine. Questions. Yeah, of course. Um, but what I'm saying... Yeah. I mean, what do, you, what do you believe? I, I believe out of the three options, the inference to the best explanation is if, if we look at the universe coming from nothing, again, that's, that's a contradiction. Uh, if we say that the universe created itself, again, that's a contradiction because it presupposes a universe, isn't it? So the universe created itself. So the universe created itself presupposes the term universe. Um, it's like a, it's like picking yourself up from your bootstraps. It's not really possible. Yeah. Our mother giving birth to herself. So I'm saying that the plausible explanation is, and this is again through whether it's rationality, even philosophy as well, you've got the likes of Leibniz and Kant and Aristotle. They didn't necessarily have an issue with believing that there was something at the beginning, that there was someone at the beginning of the chain. So for me as a Muslim, I believe that there is... Um, did that happen before when you guys were here? Okay, I think he's just making his rounds. <laughs>